Well, good Sunday morning, folks. It is the last Sunday of the month of August 2020, August the 30th, and I'm so glad that you've tuned in. I hope you're having a great day. I hope you were able to stay awake during this sermon this morning. Not always easy, I know. Just kidding. Just uh, a poor attempt at a little preacher humor there, folks. But uh, we are continuing on our study of the book of Proverbs. And so I hope you have got your Old Testaments. I hope they're open to the book of Proverbs. And if they're open to the book of Proverbs, I hope you'll turn to chapter 7 and you'll follow along. I love the book of Proverbs, and it is a magnificent study. There is nothing that will help you be more successful in every area, every arena of life than the wisdom found in this very unique and very exciting book. Well, what we've been trying to do, as you know, most of you have tuned in on a regular basis, and you know that we're trying to take about a chapter every class se- class session. Uh, once we were able to do two chapters, occasionally we're going to be able to do that. Today, I think, is one of those days where we're going to be able to take two chapters, chapter 7 and chapter 8, of course, we'll actually know as the morning progresses. And by morning progresses, I mean the 30 or 35 minutes or so that we have today. And so with that in mind, let's take a look at chapter 7. I don't think we're going to take a long time to go through chapter 7 simply because uh, he is basically repeating material that he gave in chapter 5. This is all about chapter 7 is really all about once more warning us of the pitfalls of sexual immorality. Now, it shouldn't surprise us that uh, this warning is repeated, that we're going to find multiple places in the book of Proverbs where this warning is raised. The alarm is sounded. Because as I've said before, and I will say it again, God created us as sexual beings and there is uh, almost nothing more powerful in the human experience than that dimension of our nature. And more people probably fall in that area of life than any other area of life. Uh, We are so vulnerable God makes that crystal clear when He shows us people like the man after his own heart, David, falling flat on his face in that area. And so it shouldn't surprise us that over and over and over again, God warns us of the danger of going down that road. Okay, with that in mind, let's take a look. Now, the first few verses are a fatherly appeal to wisdom. Just take a look. We'll read through verse 5. My son, keep my words and treasure my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live. And my teaching is the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. In other words, uh, as I've said before, when he talks about this idea of writing them on your heart, the idea here is that this teaching should be internalized. Uh, It should be a part of our character and personality. It is so easy to listen to instruction and we get it for the moment and it's not long that it's gone. Not long after that initial teaching. Because it's not internalized. Uh, He's saying, look, you've got to internalize this. When you hear my teaching... Don't just at that moment find it to be something attractive and something appealing and something helpful. And then you kind of go on and you don't think about it. You don't meditate on it. You don't reflect on it. And suddenly you really don't remember the details. He's saying internalize it. If you'll internalize my teaching, make it a part of your personality, make it a part of your character, then it's going to bless your life. Bind them on your fingers, verse 3. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call understanding your intimate friend. Now, there's a couple of images that we can relate to. The closeness of family. The closeness of certain friendships. You know, I've got a lot of people that I call a friend, but I don't have nearly as many people 
that I would describe as a close, close friend. Uh, it's the same with you. You've got a lot of people that you'll call a friend, but then you have those close friends. And, and he's using that imagery here. He says wisdom should be one of your close friends. It should be like a relative. There should be this relationship between you and wisdom that is very, very special. Verse 5, that they may keep you, here we go, that they may keep you from the adulteress, from the foreigner who flatters with her words. Okay, here it goes, son, listen to my wisdom. I'm going to tell you about women. Of course, this principle works both ways. I'm going to tell you about sexual purity. Now listen to me. Make this a part of your personality, your character. Don't forget what I'm about to say. Verse 6. Now what we'll find here in verse 6 through verse 33 is uh, it's kind of an interesting take. It's a little bit different than what we saw in chapter 5. Now, of course, as I said, uh, the subject matter is the same. But in this particular section, uh, the exhortation takes on the form of a story. Let's take a look at it. Uh, what, what the Father is doing here, He is describing something that he watches transpire. He sees something playing out before his eyes. And he knows what's going to happen. You know, sometimes you can be watching something and you'll go, oh, yeah, I know what's going to happen. Maybe you tuned into that documentary. You know, the one uh, on, on the Nature Channel, the Discovery Channel, the one where, again, the cameras are right there on the plains of Africa and they're showing the wildlife and then they'll show kind of this big, they'll, they'll, kind of, uh, they'll kind of expand out the picture and you can see from a long way away and you can see the, you know, the, the young wildebeest over here. And then coming over the horizon, you can see uh, creeping along the, the mother lion and you can see the wildebeest begin to walk this way, and you go, ah, oh, I know what, yeah, I know where this is going. I know what's going to happen. Well, that's what's going on here, beginning in verse six. There's a scene playing out, and he's going, let me tell you, I know what's going to happen here. I know exactly what's going to happen here. And so with that in mind, let's watch the scene play out. Verse six. For at the window of my house, I looked out through my lattice, and I saw among the native, uh, the native, I saw among the naive, and discerned among the youths, a young man lacking sense. Oh man. I saw this guy who just doesn't make good choices. He just lacks sense. I saw him, verse 8, passing through the street near her corner. And he takes the way to her house. Okay, I can, look, I don't even have to read the rest of it. Even if somebody wasn't familiar with the Bible and you read those three verses to them, 6, 7, and 8, that person's going to go, oh yeah, I know what's going to happen. I saw a naive person who lacks sense walking uh, to the home of a sexually promiscu promiscuous woman. You go, what's going to happen next? Everybody would go, I know what's going to happen next. The guy without any sense is going to walk right into the house. That's what's going to happen. So he sees all this unfolding here. Verse 9, let's continue the story. In the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, and in darkness, and behold, a woman comes out to meet him, dressed as a harlot and cunning of heart. She is boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She is now in the streets, now in the squares, and lurks by every corner. So she seizes him and kisses him, and with a brazen face, she says to him. Now, if you're thinking, wow, that there is an aggressive woman, then you are right on target. She is loud, 
She is seductive. She is boisterous. Her behavior shows her immodesty. It shows her immorality. He, he's describing, it is the perfect description of a, uh, of a woman who lacks discretion. Her feet don't remain at home. She's boisterous. She's rebellious. She lurks in the streets. And now in the squares, every corner, she grabs him and she kisses him and she says to him, uh, and so what does she say to him? Well, look at verse 14. I was due to offer offerings. Today I have paid my vows, therefore I have come out to meet you. Now this is pretty interesting. Look at that again. I was due to offer peace offerings. You know, that sounds like she was making sacrifices to God. I, I think that's the idea here. She, she was at the temple making sacrifices. Um... Well, you say that doesn't really make sense. Here's this loose woman who's who's has this who says she's religious. Yeah, what doesn't make sense about that? What doesn't make sense about you you think all religious people are sexually pure? Uh, you, you think all spiritually minded people are um, are authentic in their spirituality? You think all are equally committed? Now, this is, this is very typical. An immoral, worldly person, but still there's a veneer of faith there. But she says to him, Today I paid my vows. I was due to offer peace offering. Therefore, I have come out to meet you. She seems to be using the pretext of religion to kind of assuage his... Uh, any moral qualms that he has about this. Well, I don't know about this. I don't know if this is right. And so she uses, it seems, again, the pretext of religion to calm that. I can almost hear her now, listen, I've made myself right with God. This is okay. Listen, if grace won't cover this, what in the world is grace for? Look, God understands my situation and God understands your situation. He knows what I deal with. He knows what you deal with. And I can't help but to think He brought us together because there's something terribly lacking in both of us. You can hear that. Those are the same kinds of things that are said today. Uh, it's awful. Uh, it, it is awful how manipulative uh, people can be. And, and he's warning his son, listen, don't fall for the manipulation. Uh, when it comes to uh, you know, sexual purity, Satan is going to try everything in the book to bring you down. And here's some of the things he's going to try. Okay, he, she says, I paid my vows, therefore I've come out to meet you to seek your presence earnestly, and I have found you. Look at verse 16. What we have in verses 15 through 20 is, again, more of that manipulation. Oh, my goodness. She is describing a luxurious evening before him. And the more she talks, the more he's inflamed and the more he is weakened. Listen to this luxurious night of intimacy described. Verse 16, I have spread my couch with coverings, with colored linens of Egypt. I have sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us drink our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with our caresses. Come back to my beautiful, luxurious room, bedroom, and let's enjoy each other all night. That's what she's saying to him. Verse 19, For my husband is not at home, he has gone on a long journey. 
there's no chance, in other words, of getting caught. Listen, we're going to be all alone in my private. No one's going to see us. Everything's going to be okay. He has taken a bag of money with him, verse 20. And the full moon, at the full moon, he will come home. Look, he packed, he prepared for a long trip. I'm not worried about him just popping in. I know when he's coming back. Nobody is here. It's just me and it's just you. Verse 21. With her many persuasions, she entices him. With her flattering speech, she seduces him. He crumbles like a sack of wheat. He is done for. Suddenly, verse 22, again, he's watching. He sees out his window this naive young man and he sees the direction she's going and he sees her come out to meet him and he knows it is over. I know what's going to happen and it happened. Verse 22 and and verse 23 uh, says, okay, that happened. She persuaded him. She convinced him. He went in. And now he is about to pay the full price for her services. And that full price is his life. Suddenly he follows her. This is verse 22. Suddenly he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool unto an arrow pierces through his liver as a bird hastens to the snare so he does not know that it will cost him his life. You know, one of my favorite... Uh, it shows on TV. It's a reality show. It's called Meat Eater. And I know some of you watch that. I know Dwayne, you watch that. I was talking to Jason Lambert. I know you watch that. And I got a feeling there's several people who watch that. You hunter types, especially. Listen, I'm not really a big hunter. I've squirrel hunted a little bit in my life. But man, I love the show. And um, it's this guy. He goes all over the world hunting big game and and he is just kind of a, a culinary master at, at fixing recipes of big game and all. But, but in that show, of course, whether he's hunting doll sheep in the deepest reaches of Alaska or whether he is in uh, New Zealand hunting a critter called a tar or whether he is hunting caribou or mule deer or grouse or ducks or squirrels or rabbits whatever he's hunting, and as as it takes the viewer on the hunt. Uh, here comes the caribou. Here comes the doll sheep. And he's gotten himself in the right position. And that caribou has no idea. He's just caribouing around. He's just doing what he's done for the last eight years of his life or more. And suddenly, before he knows it, His life's gone, and he's on the dinner table. That's the image he uses here. He's talking about hunting. Uh, He's talking about uh, that. That's that's how it works. Until an arrow, verse twenty-three again. Until an arrow pierces through his liver, as a bird hastens to the snare, so he does not know that it will cost him his life. He's clueless. He thinks everything is great. Listen, if you go down that road, he's saying to his son, if you go down this road. You can be led so easily down a road sexually that's going to destroy you. Oh, he's begging his son to listen. I wish more young people would listen. I wish more middle-aged people would listen. I wish more older people would listen. This is so important. Um, it is, it is the most destructive thing and it is the easiest thing to be caught up into and swept along by. And you don't even know, everything is going to be fine one moment, or it seems fine, and then disaster is going to strike. Now, of course, that disaster that's going to strike may very well be uh, when you breathe your last breath, and then suddenly you're standing before an infinitely holy God, and you learn something you really already knew, and that is uh, you, you weren't alone alone with your tempter or your temptress. God sees everything. Uh, But he says, the end is destruction. Please, don't fall for it. It's going to be enticing. Don't fall for it. It's going to be appealing. Don't fall for it. It's going to appeal to everything that's in you. Don't fall for it. 
Look at verse 24. Now do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 24. I'll I'll jump down to verse 25. Uh, What we have here in verse 24 through verse 27 is this concluding exhortation and appeal. Now therefore, my sons, listen to me and pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn away to her ways. Do not stray into her paths, for many are the victims she has cast down, and numerous are all her slain. Her house is the way to Sheol, that is death, descending to the chambers of death. He's saying, listen, immoral women, and it's immoral men too, again, this principle works both ways, are monsters. They are monsters. And they are appealing uh, beneath all that appealing exterior. They may look great. They may sound great, but they are monsters. And do not ever forget that. Resistance takes constant uh, constant vigilance. Okay, chapter 8. Well, I said we're going to get through two. I said we'll see how that goes, though. Okay, we're 21 minutes into this thing, and I just now got to chapter 8, and we've got 36 verses there. Um, I think we can cover this because this really is a summary of once again now he he, uh, he extols the virtues of wisdom. A lot of things we're going to see uh, we've already seen, but they're expressed in different words about how wonderful wisdom is. Let's just take a look at it. Uh, again, we'll kind of take selected parts here. Uh, Does not wisdom call, verse 1, and understanding lift up her voice? On the top of the heights beside the way... For the paths meet, she takes her stand. That is wisdom. Not the she of the harlot of chapter 7. That's out of the way. Now it's the she of wisdom. Wisdom is calling here. Not a harlot. This is wisdom calling out. She's beside the way. Wisdom is where the paths meet. She takes her stand. She's beside the city gates of the opening of the city at the entrance of the doors. She cries out. Uh, She's like a merchant. And again, we've seen images like this before. Uh, she's like a merchant who is hawking her wares. Uh, and we've all probably been in places where, where we see that, even if it's something like a ball game, where uh, a seller of something is announcing his product and it gets our attention and, and it may look good to us at the moment. And so we'll go, hey, I'll take one of those, pass one down this way. Or we may be in countries where we're walking along in markets and people are, you know, uh, asking you, come in, come in, take a, come into my shop, come into my shop. And uh, I've got something to show you. I've got something to show you. Some of us have been there. Uh, th- that he's, this is how he's portraying wisdom. And the point that he's making here is something that we've already made, but it's, it's worth reinforcing and reminding you of. And that is, uh, wisdom is for ordinary people. Wisdom isn't conf- confined to the Ivy League. It's not confined to Harvard. In fact, there may be a lot of learning there, but I'm not sure about much wisdom, quite frankly. It's not at Yale, it's not at Princeton, it's not at Cornell, it's not at Brown, it's not at Vanderbilt, it's not at the University of Alabama or the University of Georgia or the University of Tennessee, it's not at Harding, it's not at Freed Hardeman, and you have to go to all of these places to find wisdom. No, it's it's available to you have to pay big money to get wisdom. No, 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 no. Wisdom is here and it's for the ordinary person. And and he's wanting you to know that you can have no formal education and you can be a wise person. And that's what wisdom wants us to know. Look at verse 4. To you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O naive ones, understand prudence, and O fools, understand wisdom. Listen, she is especially making an offer to the people who are foolish. Listen, listen. If you have a, if you characteristically are naive and foolish, I want to change that in you. If you keep making awful decisions and your life is a wreck, listen, I have the solution for you. Listen to me. Come here, I've got something that's going to be helpful for you. Verse 6, I will speak noble things. I'm going to tell you everything that's right and proper, in other words. And the opening of my lips will reveal right things. 
Verse 7, For my mouth will utter truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the utterances of my mouth are in righteousness, and there is nothing crooked or perverted in them. There is nothing twisted. There is nothing perverse. There is no hidden agenda. There is no spin. She is going to tell you like it is. Wisdom, God's wisdom, He's going to give it to you straight. And you don't have to wonder, yeah, what's going on here? What's behind this? What am I not seeing? You're seeing everything. There is nothing twisted. There is nothing perverse. There is nothing hidden. Everything is truth here. Verse 9, they are all straightforward to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. I am hiding nothing, she says. You want to be wise? Please come to me. I want to give you wisdom. And I hide nothing from you. Take my instruction and not silver. And knowledge rather than the choicest gold. Wow. Now, if you've got a pile of silver here or a pile of gold and you're offered wisdom and you come up to people and you say, listen, I've got wisdom for you or I've got this pile of gold for you, I've got this pile of silver for you, what do you think most people are going to choose? Well, that's a no-brainer. You know it and I know it. Most people are going to choose that pile of silver or that pile of gold. But wisdom says, choose me instead. Choose me instead. And the reason is really simple is because her value exceeds the value of money because, listen to me closely here, she can offer what money cannot. And that is she can offer true happiness and life. Now I know this idea that money can't buy happiness. And I've heard all the sayings. Look, Leola has this little plaque in the kitchen against the backsplash that says something like, money can't buy happiness, but it can buy cows and cows make milk, and milk makes ice cream, and ice cream makes me happy. So I get it. I've seen all of that. You know, money can't buy happiness, but it can buy me a boat, and boats make me happy. I, I get all that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, it ultimately doesn't buy happiness, lasting happiness and contentment and peace and life. There are too many people who have everything they want and they are miserable. There are too many people who have never had to tell themselves no and they do not have peace. And But with wisdom, and money can't buy this, but wisdom can bring this peace in life. For wisdom, he says in verse 11, is better than jewels. Yeah, because it can bring actual, true, authentic peace and Life and happiness. And all desirable things cannot compare with her. Nothing, nothing compares with her. Verse 12, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. Uh, in other words, uh, again, wisdom teaches how to live a, a, a life that is a discreet life, a, a careful life, not a reckless life. It's going to tell you where the minefields are in life. And it's going to help you stay away from the minefields that bring devastation and injury and, and, and horror to your life. I, wisdom, I dwell with prudence and I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Now, the prudence of wisdom implies three things. Uh, let's look at this, verse 13 here. The, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth I hate. Uh, the prudence of wisdom uh, implies that, okay, well, we have to uh, reject pride, we have to reject evil behavior, we have to reject manipulative, cunning speech. That, that's where it kind of begins at. Okay, there are certain things that I'm going to lead you down. You, got, you can't, you know, you gotta, you got to behave right. You, you've got to choose good behavior. You've got to be humble. You can't be full of pride. And you've got to have, you got to speak integrity. You're not a manipulative person, a deceitful person. Uh, the second thing that uh, wisdom does, 
Uh, look at verse 14. Counsel is mine, it's sound wisdom. I am understanding. Power is mine. Uh, it gives direction to life. It gives strength to meet those challenges. Counsel is mine. Look at it again, verse 14. In sound wisdom. Counsel is mine. You know, in ministry, people people come they're, they're to me often or call me or email me and they 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 want my thoughts on something. And um, I do the same thing uh, with people that I have confidence in uh, when I might be facing something. And I just want to kind of check out my own thinking or, or um, you know, maybe see something, try to get a perspective that I'm not seeing, that I hadn't really thought about. And, and so that's what she's saying. Look, counsel is mine and sound wisdom. That is, I'm going to give you direction uh, in life. I am understanding power is mine. Power is mine. In, in other words, I, I will not only give you the direction of life, but I will also give you strength to meet those challenges. By me, by me, kings reign and rulers decree justice. Uh, by me, princes rule and nobles all who judge rightly. Listen, if you want to live in a place where there is uh, good government, uh, it will be uh, in a place where the wisdom, the wisdom, true wisdom of life that comes from God that He's built into life is acknowledged and followed. Now, if you venture from the wisdom here, you're going to find a government in chaos. I probably don't have to tell you that it sure looks like that we are increasingly descending into chaos. Well, it shouldn't surprise us because everything that God has to say, or most, a lot of things that God has to say, uh, is, is no longer respected in, in our world, the corner of the world that we live in now. And, uh, it's, it's, it's concerning. And, but notice what he says that. This wisdom, by me, kings reign. And rulers decree justice by me, princes rule and nobles, all who judge rightly. Uh, take a look at verse 17. 17, verse 21. Uh, wisdom can even bring material benefits. This is interesting now. Uh, did you, you heard me. Wisdom can bring material benefits. Now I got your attention, don't I? I thought he said choose wisdom over gold and silver. Yeah. Choose wisdom over gold or silver. Absolutely. It's a lot more valuable. But if you choose wisdom, you might have gold and silver. Uh, it can bring that. Take a look. Look at verse 17. You, I'm not making this up. It's right here. I love those who love me, and those who def, diligently seek me will find me. Riches and honor are with me. Enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even pure gold. My yield better than the choice of silver. I walk in the way of righteousness in the midst of passive justice to endow those who love me with wealth that I may fill their treasuries. Is that the gospel of health and welfare? No, not at all. It's not the gospel of health and, health and welfare, but it is saying this. If you follow the path that I'm going to give you for life, then there is a greater likelihood that you will have something in life. Because remember, I said the book of Proverbs is all about making choices in all the different arenas of life. Now listen, a part of what we already saw, you know, we saw this back in chapter 6 where he's given some instructions about a work ethic. Work hard. Work hard. You outwork the next person. You work hard. Um, you know, uh, uh, my son, I, I don't, so a lot of you know this, he's for a year been in uh, at sales at Beeman Toyota. And he's doing really well. And we're, uh, you know, he has a gift for sales, we've discovered. And he's, um, he is, uh, at the top of the board in terms of, uh, of the salesman, uh, down there. Um, he, he told us last month he was number one. He was number four overall, but number one among those who don't have an assistant. Um, and, and I'll tell you, he works. I mean, 
uh, he doesn't turn it off. Uh, you know, he's single. He, he's you know doesn't have a kids and a wife, and he he works hard. And and we went in uh, in January. We were looking to get a new vehicle. We traded in the Corolla or, or got rid of the Corolla. And, and, and it was early 2020, and we, you know, the 19s, they were having deals on that. And so, hey, also buy a car from our son. So we did that. And when we walked in, um, his boss came up to us when we were sitting there and said, listen, uh, your son is out working everyone here. And, uh, uh, th- and I tell you that to say, again, this this is what the proverb says in verse 6. Well, because he's, he's focused and out and working hard, guess what? He's making more money than he's ever made in his life. Okay, you see, you see how it works? He's working hard. And not only that, I mean, if you do some other things, now, you know, you can make it, but now, how do you hold on to it? A lot of people can make it. You know, I hope he makes the choices, uses wisdom to hold on to it. Uh, you know, a lot of people can make it, and they just can't hold on to it. Well, the book of Proverbs gives you instructions in that as well. We're going to see that later about how wise people don't spend all they have. Uh, they don't consume everything. Um, they save. So all of these things are here. Uh, you're a person of integrity. Um, you don't... You know, you don't follow evil people. You live a discreet life. You live a careful life. You save money. You don't go, as we saw, you don't go in debt. You know, you don't make your, you get yourself in financial entanglements that are beyond your control. You don't sign, co-sign notes for people. and you know, uh, All of those things are there. And so if you follow wisdom, it's no wonder that, uh, that uh, wisdom can even bring material benefits. God tells us how to manage our money. Yeah. Okay, real quickly, I know we're at 37 minutes. This is probably the longest we've been. Okay, give me three more minutes. We're going to stop at 40, I promise. Verses 22 through 31 describes wisdom's role in creation. It's a wonderful section. The Lord possesses me at the beginning of His ways, before He is works of old. From everlasting I was established. From the beginning of the earliest times of the earth, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. And He just... And, and the, this proverb, this section continues to describe that. Again, it's tying wisdom to God. When we embrace wisdom, we are embracing a divine principle. We're embracing the principle uh, that God used in creation. Wisdom was this. It, let me boil it down to this. Here's the meat and potatoes. Wisdom was the first principle of the world. Wow. Wow. It is the first principle in the world. And God is now sharing that with us. And as we get down here, we have this invitation uh, uh, to people, uh, embrace creation or embrace wisdom. And by doing that, you enjoy creation. You participate in the goodness of creation. The path to that goodness is found in wisdom. Uh, verse 31, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. Okay, let's wind this up. The last few verses, verse 32, take a look at it. Now therefore, O sons, listen to me, for blessed are they who keep my ways. Blessed are they who keep my ways. Heed instructions and be wise and do not neglect it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at my doorposts. Look at that. They're waiting for me. I love those images again. Um, For he who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who sins against me injures himself and all those who hate me love death. What he's doing here in verses 32 through 36 is he's laying down a choice. Choose me, be directed to me, hang on to every word I say. That's the image of watch daily at my gates, wait at my doorposts, hang on my words, hang on my words, and uh, and be blessed. Or you can remain neutral, you can reject me, and the end is going to be bad for you. Okay, great stuff, great stuff. I hope you've enjoyed it. I have had, it's blessed me, and this new look at the Proverbs, this fresh look at the Proverbs, I'm getting so much out of it. I hope you are too. Thanks for tuning in. 
I hope to see you real soon. Take care and God bless.